Okay, thanks for everyone uh, for joining us this morning for this episode of Ask uh, the Expert. And the expert today is Jason Kaplan of Bull City Venture Partners. He's a general partner and co-founder there. And uh, thanks for joining us, Jason. Yeah, thanks, Pete. I appreciate you having me here. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, let's start, but I want to know a little more about Jason Kaplan, the man. Uh, and how you got here and how you got to be in the position uh, you are. So first of all, you're not from North Carolina. I'm not, Dublin, no. Right? Uh, and uh, so where are you from and how did you get here? Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, yeah, thanks, Pete. Uh, so um, the, the story is I grew up in uh, Fall River, Massachusetts. My, my parents are still up there. Uh, Fall so River I, Dreams, right? No? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So uh, home of Emerald Lagasse, Lizzie Borden. It's about an hour south of Austin. Um, and I go back frequently. My parents, like I mentioned, are still, still there, same house. Um, and my whole family is all within that region. Um, I... Um, I started, so I went to, uh, actually, I, I went to Guilford College, and a lot of people don't know that, but I went to Guilford College in Greensboro for two years, but I, um, out of high school, but then I, I transferred, I went back to school up in Boston, graduated from Bentley College, now Bentley University, I should say, in, in Waltham, Mass, and... Um, you got a promotion yeah. to university? Yeah, yeah, I guess they, they changed, but um, I'm, I'm so used to the Bentley College stuff, I still have all the Bentley College sweatshirts and everything, but... Um, so uh, interned for an investment banking firm in school and then uh, ended up working for them when I graduated. It's called Harrison Hurley and Company, uh, based in Providence, Rhode Island. And um, I should mention, like, um, the, I, I was very, very interested in venture capital back to, like, when I was in, in college. And I think I applied to, like, 50 VC firms. Um, and they all, all in the Boston area. And they all oh. said no. Um, uh, well, they actually, they didn't reply. The w one replied, and, okay. and uh, that was uh, Summit Partners, and they said no. But no one else kind of came back. Um, but it's something I was really, really interested in, have a kind of an entrepreneurial family on both sides. And um, and then... Um, so why, you know, why venture capital, you think, would interest you? I, I, I like the idea, Pete, of, um, of um, encouraging more entrepreneurs. Okay. Uh, and I ha having interned for the investment banking firm, you know, when we found a company that was interesting and needed capital, we had to kind of run this whole process. And I kind of like the idea of being able to move a little bit faster as well and be able to work closer with the entrepreneurs on a regular basis. Right. Okay. Um, um, this, well, yeah. So that so that so then uh, so that after the investment banking firm, I uh, I, I chatted with some VCs out there, and they were like, "Hey, look, you should really um, work for a tech company." And that's how I ended up here um, in North Carolina and, and started at Red Hat. Um, but got lucky with you know finding that role, and um, so then left Red Hat to to start this. So how did you? So how did you get to Red Hat? Were you just applying? Did you move here for that job? Yeah. Um, yes, I moved here for that job. So I started looking all along the East Coast for tech companies. After I kind of got the feedback from VCs, like, hey, you really should work at a tech company. I started looking all along the East Coast for what kind of tech companies were around and saw the Red Hat position and, and applied. And um, I remember chatting with Karen Clark, our head of HR at the time, and then Manos George, who ended up being my boss. He was CFO there. And he's like, Gosh, like you're out of you're out of, out of state, you know why? I've got a lot of qualified candidates. Why? Why you? And uh, I was like, hey, I can be in your office Tuesday and chat. I think it was Thursday, and um, so uh, I guess I, you know, he took a chance on on, on me with that role, and I, I kind of credit Red Hat for a lot of like um, the ramp to kind of get here today. Okay, um, and just before I go, when I had mentioned Fall River Dreams, I don't think anyone. Not sure it was. So that was a book about a uh, high school basketball team, right? And, yep. Uh, yeah. Chris Heron was uh, the star player, but but a, yeah, a lot there. Yeah. So Red Hat. Uh, so what did you do there? So I was in a financial organization, reporting to what ended up being, I guess, three different CFOs over two years. Mm -hmm. uh, ran their global budgeting process. Worked on M and A. Red Hat Ventures a little bit. Uh, we made investments in tech companies as well oh, okay. and startups. Uh, worked on the IPO, 
um, pricing for all the products and services. So a lot, wore a lot of hats over uh, a two year period. So joined them uh, back in 98, December 98, when there were about 80 employees and left in um, two years to the, to the day, uh, December 2000, um, to uh, launch our, our first fund. And who did you, uh, so who did you launch the first fund? What, so that was Southern Capital? Or? That was, that was, it was Southern Capital Ventures <clears throat> and launched it with Ben Brooks and, and team there. Okay. Um, and uh, so, so Southern Capital, that was a fund, I'd say for 10 years, or how, how did that become Bull City? I've never been too clear on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the quick story there is, um, so uh, David Jones and I have always been the full-time partners at Southern Capital Ventures. And, um, you know, we ran two funds there very successfully. And then unfortunately, um, you know, two, two things happened. One, um, Dave Murray, our, our marketing partner, um, passed away in his 40s for a rare heart condition, um, which still doesn't seem real. And um, so that happened. And then, and then Ben, our, our founding partner, which was, you know, he's kind of the reason why I'm doing this, you know, big reason why I'm doing this today. He, uh, you know, he, as he got older, he's got five kids and he's also a wealth manager here in North Carolina. And so he kind of wanted to focus more on that. David and I, as the younger guys, we wanted to keep going. So that's, uh, we, we split off and created our own separate fund called Bull City Venture Partners. He and I still, David and I still today manage out what's left in Southern Capital Ventures. Okay. And what are some of the local ones in Southern Capital? Yeah, we might not. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we were an investor in. Choose. Um, uh, uh, let's see here. Do a little promotion in Etex. Oh, okay. Um, huge mug. Um, Channel Advisor, uh, Motricity, Art.com. Um, so yeah, we 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 in, in the first fund, we invested in eight companies, and the second fund we invested in eleven. Um, okay. So the first fund was all North Carolina companies. Second fund we started kind of getting more into the DC, Northern Virginia, Maryland uh, market as well. Okay. So like, then, uh, another one would be Wedding Wire, which we sold. Uh, right. You're kind of fading in and out. Uh, uh, um, okay. And, and then, uh, so what were, what was kind of the seat was inner South sort of the biggest tech VC player in the triangle then? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so th there were, you know, over the years, uh, so if, yeah, absolutely. In our South here, Aurora here, um, there was another firm called Southeast Interactive when we started. There was Eno River here, Research Triangle Ventures. Um, there was, I'm missing another one. Um, yeah, but there was, a, there was a handful of other ones and accelerators, and other stuff, you know, here in the area too. Do you feel like overall there was more venture money, local venture money then? I think we, I think what's happened, um, Pete, is I would say there are more dollars. I think there are more sources now. Right. So um, I would say the and those dollars were concentrated between a, a few firms, um, but but today I think there are more sources of capital. Just everyone has each source has less money. If that makes sense. Right. More because of the addition of. The angel groups. Uh, I think it's angel, yeah, I think it's angel groups to the university programs, um, individuals writing pretty big checks, um, venture like checks. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And 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 as always, there's you know over the years, as I, I think it's like over eighty percent of the capital that gets invested in North Carolina companies comes from outside the area. Right. And uh, what um why though do you think that there is not really a VC firm here that, you know, there isn't necessarily a player that can write $10 million check, a $20 million check. Uh, is that sort of, is there some sort of chicken and egg of, you know, if there were really big, you know, it would take a really big IPO to kind of spin off that or what, why are, is there not like something as big as InterSouth or a couple of InterSouths? Uh, here. Yeah, I mean, you know, and there's Frontier Capital down in Charlotte, right? right? So they're looking for bigger. They have. I mean, are they more private equity? They are. They are. But they have the ability to write that 10, 20, you know, $30 million check uh, into a tech company. 
Um, but, but absolutely. But yeah, I mean, I guess a, why isn't there a bigger fund here today? I think it, you know, I think markets are, this is probably not going to be the, the favorable, the, the, you know, the favorite answer for the entrepreneurs to hear, but like, I think it kind of matches the opportunity set. Right. Uh, meaning, meaning what? Uh, yeah, meaning like I mean, um, if companies if, were better, there'd be bigger. Uh, not the companies were better, but there are more companies that deserve, you know, right. that ten million dollar check. There would be a fund here potentially to support it. Right now, it's pretty easy for a fund in Atlanta or a fund in DC to fly in and swoop in and and, and do that ten million dollar deal. And, right. And capital today, capital is so mobile at that for that stage that there's there's capital from all over the U S looking for those kinds of kinds of deals at our later stage. We, that's probably the um, easiest capital to, to get right now. The or, over the last, that, over the mean, last few years, I just didn't say right now. Right. Um, I mean, if, so my uh, hearing you, like if there were a lot more pundos here, there'd be more, VCs that could write that check or the other. I, yeah, I think that. I think what would happen is you know maybe you have someone that um, you know either a, a fund here that grows in size mm -hmm. um, to to do that or someone launch you know ha puts a small office here or a partner here um, you know someone that wants to move home maybe that grew up here but now is out in the valley and they're like hey look I really like, there's a lot of there's a lot of VCs I'll meet like out in the you know, in the Valley and they're, right. they're from like Tennessee or somewhere in the Southeast. Right. And they would love to find more deals here or move back because their family's here. So I could see, I could see that happening as well. Okay. Here, what is there, is there one thing or a couple of things that you wish that more entrepreneurs knew about venture capital, you know, the jobs that that you guys do at Bull City and just in general, like a misperception or two that, you know, you run into a lot. I, you know, it's, it, I would say like, um, I would say, yeah, I think, I think, I think it's a really good question. The, the, the thing I think it needs to be out there is like, without the entrepreneurs, you know, we go out of business. There is no business for Bull City, right? So my job is to interact with as many entrepreneurs as I possibly can. And I think, you know, we want to be known as super approachable. Uh, 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 I feel like sometimes others feel like they can't, you know, there's, there's that mystery VC there, you know, out, you know, just, you know, and it's, you know, I don't know, beautiful office space somewhere with, you know, fancy tables and, and off, but that's not the case with us. It's like, um, for us to do our job, my job is to interact with more entrepreneurs and find more investments. So super, you know, I look at us as David and I are super approachable. You know, we post our emails on our website. Um, and, you know, again, you know, just want to make sure that we're there to support the community. How much do you think it would impact this area if there was, or I've been a big, say a unicorn that's a consumer facing Unicorn. I mean, it seems like some of the, you know, Austin had Dell and, you know, Microsoft and Amazon in Seattle. Um, but, you know, Pendo obviously is doing, Red Hat is a very large company, but it's not like the person on the street knows that are not doing TV ads or something. Do you, do you think it, it would change, you know, the perception of, of this market for startups if there is one that sort of everyone kind of new yeah i think i think it takes it takes time pete right i mean this market is still the, the raleigh durham area is still is still i mean i think early innings by the way i'm totally convinced of that i feel like hey over the next 10 20 years we're we're gonna keep keep developing over time so um but to your question i think it's not about just the unicorn status it's the exit of that unicorn right right so it's putting money in the pockets of, mm -hmm. um, of, of employees there so that they can go out and start their own. So if you look at, if you look at like Red Hat as an example, I think there's like over 20 CEOs that came out of Red Hat, right? right. And so they, they, mean, they Joe were, is one, right? Joe Colopy is, you know, the godfather, you know, uh, you know, of your business is, is, of Grep Beat is, is one of them, right? So, um, but 
the, and those, those CEOs spread out throughout the country. Um, but you know, VCs came out of that. So like I came out of that, there was a guy that at another VC firm. Um, so I think seeing that success, putting capital in the pockets of some of the uh, employees there, not just concentrated to a handful, you know, two, three, four, five people, but really distributed out, right. you know, helps out a lot. And you need that because not only for people starting new businesses and becoming new CEOs, but you need to put money, enough money in the pockets where people can become angel investors as well. Right, right. Okay. And then all of a sudden they're back in their friends' companies, right? Right. Um, okay. All right. Let's, let's start taking some questions uh, for Jason. Uh, so you can start raising your hand uh, and uh, see how that goes. And there is someone who asked a Q&A here. So Caden Eisler, if I'm saying that right. Caitlin. What, are, what are the marketing analytics investors care about when considering investments in the B2C space? Do you do mm. much B2C? Are we don't. Saying? We don't. Yeah, we don't. We don't do a ton in the, in the B2C space. Um, yeah, I think, I think we, you know, it depends the stage. But we, I, I will say overall, we spend a lot of time looking at, you know, unit economics and does this business make a lot of sense? Should we be investing more into the, you know, into the business? Like we're looking at another one right now. We just made a verbal offer, by the way, to an entrepreneur here locally uh, to invest in his business. And we spent a lot of time uh, with the last couple of days with him uh, looking at the unit economics and really understanding that. Um, and in his business, which it, it's different than what Caitlin's asking, but right. it, it's a software business. We, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at that and to see, Hey, should we spend more money in sales and marketing? And right now his, the way that his unit economics are, are structured, it makes a lot of sense to do that. So we're like, Hey, we should be investing more in the business and more in sales and marketing and, and put a heavier foot down on that given where, where the business is. Um, but yeah, we're not we're not a more we're not as as consumer focused as Caitlin's Caitlin's businesses. Right. Definitely. Why why do you guys focus on B two B versus B two C? I think it's I think it's something that we feel like we understand a little bit more, Pete. Um, I right. feel like those are the relationships that we can bring to our companies. So when our companies ask for connections, like out to the valley uh, to larger businesses. Uh, like Facebook and Google and some of the, you know, uh, or not, or Salesforce or um, Oracle or whatever, you know, we, we have more connections there to be helpful. I will say we have done, I guess the closest to the consumer side we've done, you know, we're an investor in Spoonflower. Um, okay. We're also an investor. Um, we were an investor in Wedding Wire, which is B2B to C. Right. Um, so, but yeah, just strictly focused on the consumer side. I would say we have less expertise there um to to really be helpful okay uh here's a question from craig demko who are some of the other vcs that are jumping on flights to look at companies in the triangle more regularly yeah yeah I, i'll say um give it to craig to ask that um so i i, I think the the my when i mentioned that before it's for the companies that are doing approaching $10 million in revenue. That's the magic number. So as the capital becomes very mobile at that point, and I would say, Hey, it's firms like uh, Excel. It's, you know, Andreessen um, up in New York, the guys at, at Catalyst have been really inquisitive. We've invested, co-invested with them before in wedding wire. Um, Where's Catalyst? Uh, uh, not general Catalyst, uh, Catalyst. Catalyst. Right. But general catalyst is inquisitive too. Like they put money in teamworks here locally, right? right so right. so uh, where you know, is catalyst? Where are they located? Uh, catalyst is right. located in New York. Okay. Uh, and so, but Holly is looking for, you know, she put money in teamworks. She's looking for more deals here. Um, so at that stage, the the it it's almost like um, geography all doesn't matter, and it's about if they find a. $10 million business or a company approaching $10 million. Um, they, and that's growing fast. Right. M markets are very efficient and, and people look wherever uh, level equity is uh, super inquisitive. LLR is here a lot. So uh, I guess those are some of the names I can throw out there for, for Craig. For, for you guys, what uh, you mentioned there are 10 million revenues. It's going to get those people on a plane. What, 
what piques your interest? Because you guys are a little earlier than that, probably. Yep. Um, like, what would you say if you're not at X, you know, not to say never, but we're, you know, yep. come back when you're at X? Yeah. So if you look at us, um, you know, over the last like two decades, uh, the, uh, our company's kind of fit in these buckets. I would say 80% fall in the 30 to 300K in MRR, um, mm-hmm. monthly recurring revenue. Right. Okay. So 30 to 300, it's a, it's, that's our sweet spot. Uh, 10% are seed deals, roughly, uh, where it's a person and an idea. They may, they may not even have an, uh, a name yet to the company. Um, so super early. And right. then, and then another 10% is those, those 10% though, are those generally people who've had a successful exit before? I mean, you get yeah. to have a bias for it prior. Yeah. 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 I would say, um, usually those C deals are people that we've also known for a long time. So one, a very experienced entrepreneur, maybe it's someone we worked with before. Um, but I would say I would label them as a very, very experienced, experienced founder. Right. Okay, so sorry. Um, then another ten percent, our later stage, we'll, we'll invest in a company that's doing maybe five, ten, fifteen, twenty million in revenue. Um, and again, you know, it's it's still a Series A, by the way. So it's maybe it's a bootstrap business in the Southeast. Okay. Um, but again, usually it's someone we've known for a long time. Would you make a, a first investment at that stage, or is that usually more of a follow-on? Um, uh, no, for the later stage stuff, it's usually still a series A first time that maybe the company has raised outside capital. Right. Um, okay. So some examples of that would be like a company like Etix was later stage when we got in. Uh, Wedding Wire was certainly at the later stage. Um, Global Value Commerce locally, which sells golf clubs online. Um, so yeah, those are some of the later later stage. Uh, Spoonflower um, right. certainly fits that. Um, and again, it's, it's a, usually a team that we've known for a while, very capital, built their company very, very capital efficiently, uh, maybe didn't like VCs early on, you right? And right. we had to kind of like butter them up on why, why us. So, um, and then eventually they decided to not take like VCs. Huh? You guys are very okay, local, right? Be, be, you know what? I think that's the, that's the thing. People don't know. It's like, this is, we're, we're salespeople, right? So we're, sell, we're selling capital and uh, for the best entrepreneurs, and the best ideas, like they have choices and we have to convince them like, right, right. Why, why us? Like why take our capital? Right. I mean, yeah, all capital, there's no free money. You know, so yeah. Yeah. But free. we're, but we're, we're selling ourselves and yeah. why bull city over another firm and right. you know, the best entrepreneurs have, have choices. So we understand that. Right. But also why bull city as opposed to no firm, like why venture money? I mean, what, what is your, because certainly some view, you know, if you, if you take venture money, then, you know, the, they're giving you the money because they want a certain kind of exit because they need to return the money to their investors. So you're, you're going down a path that might be a different path than if you don't take venture money. Um, if you, if you encounter a, absolutely, uh, you know, a company where you'd like to get in and, you know, you said that you could help you grow faster, but they're resistant for, you know, taking money at all what, what is your your argument there if there was just on taking money at all right uh I, I think i think we try to run through exercises with them as like hey you, usually there's some kind of use of capital um right maybe like going back to like caitlin's question about the unit economics um maybe like we can kind of show them like what those dollars could be used for um if we did put some money in or maybe there's some connections we can be helpful with, like some introductions right. um, in, the, in the business community. And, and so they want that, or maybe they want help with um, recruiting. And so it's like, hey, we, you know, we can help you build out your team a little bit more or help you hire more salespeople or engineers. So we, we try to find like, what do they want and, and, and sell that, you know? Right. Uh, and so it's like, Hey, what can we do to be helpful here? And, and by the way, we we found some companies along the way that where we, we try to do that, um, you know, locally and, and, and failed at, um, at selling them, you know, on bull city and they went in a, went a different direction, either with another firm right. or, um, they, you know, chose not to raise money. Right. All right. Here, someone has raised their hand. 
Claire Cormier. So I'm going to, I think you're now turned on, Claire, or you can. Are you there? There you go. Hi, Jason. Hey, Claire. Hey, Pete. Hey. I just wanted to ask what advice you're giving your portfolio companies to best manage through this crisis at this time. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a that, question. Yeah, yeah, a gr great, great question. Um, I think a few things there, Claire, which we're trying to be like, you know, help our companies with is um, one, I think we're trying to make sure that, you know, they're very uh, transparent uh, with folks. So we're trying to, you know, make sure that they're transparent with their employee base, um, with their customers partners um so that's that's one thing and, and, and make sure like very a very very high level of of communication um so if you look at like a lot of our portfolio companies right now they're you know updating us you know every every couple of weeks on, on what's going on um with their business i think another thing too is this is probably the first thing i you know i guess i guess these are all the things we're talking about talking to them about is the first thing i'm talking to them is like hey health health first you know, focus on keeping employees, you know, and families healthy. That's probably the number, the number one thing I should have mentioned. Um, the two, the second thing I think is, is important here is, is, you know, making sure that you help your customers. So we tell, we're talking about like, look, you have an opportunity to prove, you know, that you're a partner well beyond a vendor. And so be memorable, um, help them through this, this difficult time you know, just maintain a relentless focus on the customer. What are their, you know, find out what their needs are. Changed. Um, I think the, the third thing, uh, be decisive. So, you know, we talked, we were talking to them about, Hey, think critically and, and act. Um, and then, and then I would say the, the last thing we're, we're talking with them about is, you know, plan for the worst. So make sure the cash lasts longer. Um, we always say, Hey, things could get worse before they get better. Um, and so look for opportunities to, to manage cash, you know, very, very closely. And that could be, you know, delaying, uh, new hires, um, minimizing non-personnel expenses. Uh, so yeah, th I think those are probably the, the top, the top items I do. Um, I do think we, we, a, a few weeks ago, one of the, one of the hot topics and I've, shared a lot of this on, on Twitter is uh, around PPP. And mm -hmm. that, that was like a, a scorching hot topic in our portfolio for a couple of weeks where we kind of brought all our companies together as well in a, in a Zoom call and, and chatted more about it. But um, anyway, so that's kind of- Did anyone end up actually taking it? Any of your portfolio companies? I know people kind of kick the tires and then, you yeah. know, there are reasons not to take it. Almost yeah. more reasons not to. Yeah. Where did you guys yeah. come out on that? I, I think um, we took a very, very conservative stance with it, Pete, and I think that'll be to our benefit long term. Um, the oval, yes, we have some, in terms of leaning against it. Against it, yeah. So I think a lot of people looked at it as as free money, and you know I'm going to go out and get my get mine kind of thing. And, you know, our, our view is like, hey, there's, there's, no, there's no free money out there. Uh, there's not, it's not free, free money and um, there, there are strings attached to it. And you do have to rep that your business needs it to survive, right? And a lot of our companies- like past, you have to say, legally. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And a lot of our companies can't, can't do that. And, um, not all our companies are, um, many of them are not in, in bad shape. And in fact, uh, what's, what's interesting about what's going on right now is some of them, what's going on has actually accelerated their growth. So we've got one that went from, for example, from, uh, you know, a 20% growth rate to a 90% growth rate. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's, a, and it's a large business. So, um, so they no, not everyone can rep and say, "Hey, we we needed the capital." So to answer your question, the overwhelming majority of our companies did not take it, um, but there were a few that you know were des more desperate and and absolutely needed to survive. So for those companies that did take it, hey, it's fantastic. You know, I'm I'm glad this is in play and uh, protects a lot of jobs and 
Um, kudos to the, to the government for doing that. But I, I think we took a very conservative stance. And I think that matches up with a lot of the larger VC firms um, throughout the country as well. Right. Okay, here's a question from Victoria Centeno. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right, but I know her. She works at CED. She's a former winner of Where's Pete, which is obviously first on her resume. It's so big, by the way. It's big. Right. Yeah, of course it's big. Uh, so, you know, speaking of. Okay. What a, so what area outside? Yeah, a little, little, little place. In what area in outside, house. What's that? You're in your house. Yeah, yeah. Winner. I'm at home, exactly. Uh, what area outside of North Carolina would you say most closely mimics the triangle in regards to investment and entrepreneurs? So out of state areas that I mean, you guys play, I guess, mostly in the Southeast, um, but there's places where you're like, this reminds me a lot of the triangle for X reasons. So out of state? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the pockets that we spend the most amount of time in are, um, you know, Atlanta, the the D.C. area has been really, and then, you know, so D.C., Northern Virginia, I'll throw Maryland in that bucket as well. So like Baltimore, um, you know, I think they're all, they all have some similarities and they all have some, some, they're all very distinct in their own ways as well. The similarities though, I think are, you know, the, the entrepreneurs all have a little bit of a, of a, I think anyone else in the Valley kind of does, um, where they feel like they have to do a little extra to kind of earn it. And um, so, but yeah, they, those, are the, those are the markets I think that are probably, that we think are similar. Hey, they're underserved. Entrepreneurs have a little more grit. They work harder. Um, and again, but, sorry. What? Sorry? Kind of faded out a bit. Wh which, which markets? Uh, so we, fo we focus on Atlanta. Right. DC, Northern Virginia, Maryland. Um, that's kind of another, another market we focus on. And then outside of that, you know, you know, we're spending more and more time up in Philly as well. Okay. Um, what are there, are there some things that you've noticed that Atlanta or one of those other markets does well that you felt like, Hey, you know, we could learn from, from that sort of thing here. It would be nice to have that. And I think I've heard on some Atlanta, like maybe some of the real big companies in Atlanta, kind of try and do things a little more formally to help startups. Um, but are there any sort of initiatives or, or things you've noticed in other communities that uh, you think that maybe we can learn from? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think here, Pete, like, you know, some of the bigger companies here have gotten pretty like um, involved. So don't forget like, you know, Red Hat's an LP in our funds. Cisco is an, uh, is an LP. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield is an LP in our fund. Capital Broadcasting. Um, so some of the lo bigger local companies here kind of rally behind, you know, our fund and firm, um, as they, you know, deeply care about this, this region. Um, and, um, but I, th I think in Atlanta, one thing that I, that I do like is, you know, the number of fortune 500 businesses there is, is great. Um, Chick-fil-A is based there, which is, which is, a, which is, which is a win. Um, but I think not on Sunday, but okay. Yeah. Not on Sunday, not on Sunday. Um, but the thing I think that makes it really interesting is the angel community there is really vibrant. And I think that's the same thing in the DC area that I like a lot. Um, the angel community in, in Atlanta is, is DC like, in that they'll write some of those angel investors will write checks of like, a million to two million dollars into as individuals, um, which is very very powerful. Up in the D.C. area, we see a lot more angels than we probably do here, and they're writing smaller checks. So they're writing and they'll cobble together something really fast, um, but they're writing smaller checks of like, you know, ten to fifty k each. But they'll cobble together all their friends and, and mobilize that and uh, and have something closed re relatively quickly. Okay. Uh, well, speaking of angels, here's a question from Mark Friedman uh, at RTP Capital. Uh, we have a much better relationship in the triangle between angels yeah. and VC than most other areas in the country, along with common relationships in the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem. What do you think should be done moving forward to make that even stronger? So the ties between VCs and angels in this area. Yeah, yeah. Um... 
I think a couple, a couple things. One, you know, it goes, you know, it, we tried this out in our first fund, by the way. Um, I don't talk a lot about it, but we invested in the angel group uh, as, as our, at our fund one. So, um, and then we had, you know, then we we're active with that, with that group. So that's one thing, you know, maybe we all think about again, um, but that was helpful because we would see everything. We would be part of the discussion. Um, when they went to make an investment, you know, one thing they would ask is like, Hey, if this company matures, would you be interested in the A round potentially? Um, so I think there was a, a stronger communication there. Um, but I think, you know, look, I mean, Mark and I, you know, we'll grab coffee every once in a while. I think right. getting that strong relationship uh, it is helpful. I think that's why I, I, I see, plus Mark's a great guy, but I think we, you know, just try to make sure we, you know, see each other pretty regularly. And I think the same goes for like the other VCs here. Like we try to spend more time with like the other venture capitalists here too, and make sure we're collaborating and sharing deals. And um, I, I think, uh, you know, if you look at it now, you know, out of this, out of fund three, I think we've co-invested with idea fund three times, you know, so we're, we're trying to make sure that, you know, we're collaborating more, more locally. I think it's a great question. I think it's, I'd love to hear Mark's, you know, thoughts as well, but he probably has a better response than me, but I think it's important to be thinking about. What about, the, what interactions do you and, you know, Bull City have uh, with the university kind of affiliated Andrew groups can and, and win and wants to do Dan, like, I mean, they're definitely writing a lot of checks the last few years. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we we're chatting with all the, all, all of them. So uh, we're sharing deals where they've come in a few of our companies. So obviously you have to have that, that Duke connection or the win connection, but uh, win is invested in a couple of our companies um can has looked at some of you know some of our companies as well so absolutely i mean if you look at if you look at all of our companies pete over the last two decades you know there's always other investors in in you know that we've co-invested with so those include angels angel groups other vcs so it, it's pretty common to have another venture south has come in a few of our companies by the way not not mentioned uh here yet but they uh, co-invested with us a few times so it's it's we're we're always looking for more too. There's no no, no sharp elbows here, right? Um, so uh, here's a question from Joshua Chadnowitz. He said, "Jason, I've known you now for 20 years. Can you believe oh it's been that long? Yeah, well, I can believe. Uh, and I have to say, you were one of the most stand-up venture partners I have ever met. This is clearly a plant. Uh, thank you, for okay, right? You do over and above what other VCs would ever do for a founder." Uh, Dude, I need to my credit card here. Related to you. Uh, question for you. If you could give only one piece of advice to an entrepreneur, what would you share with that founder like myself trying to build the next billion dollar success? So I guess one piece of advice. Only You can only give one piece of advice. You know, I think, I think this is something that um, I probably learned from um, – Josh, probably early on. Okay. <clears throat> By the way, Josh was, um, as background, Josh was the founder of, co founder of art.com, which was oh, here. Okay. Um, but, you know, he and, and his co founder, uh, Mike Marston, were relentless and had, you know, a lot of hustle. Um, so I think that, I, I think that that's what plows through markets like this, I think. And, you know, they were very, very focused, um, worked, you know, I, I think, I'm not sure they, whatever they may have lacked in experience, they just outworked everybody. Right. And grit, I guess some people, uh, grit, I think some people like to call it, if you're gritty. Absolutely. I remember like, you know, I think like when the guys would go out, you know, for, for beers, you know, during the weekend or whatever, you know, when we're single, um, we would, you know, email Josh and be like, Hey, you want to go out for, for drinks? He's like, Oh dude, I gotta, I gotta work. Right. And, okay. um, and I think that tenacity that, you know, that, um, you know, how relentless they were, that's kind of what plowed them through and got them through, you know, created a, a very, very large business. So, um, 
And he grew it to tens of millions of dollars before raising capital, by the way. Okay. Um, yeah, so hustle, I guess. Is the A- absolutely the hustle. I, I think that's, you know, that's one of my favorite words. Okay, here's a question from Dan. Who are or what are some of your favorite area startup success stories? Dan, who? Uh, who, what's Dan's last name? No, no last name given. No He's last name given. Basic, right? Yeah, yeah. No, look, I think um, favorite some local my, success stories. Yeah, some of my favorite success stories here uh, in the Raleigh Durham area are look, I, <clears throat> look not to um, give the Godfather too much credit here and, and inflate his ego. Uh, the look. Godfather of grip beat, but you know, Joe, you know, Joe got it done, right? So. Uh, Joe Colby grew, you know, left Red Hat, grew Bronto, didn't raise capital. Some of my favorite companies, by the way, never raised VC money um, and kind of grew it the old fashioned way, right? With customer revenue and grew it brick by brick, maybe a little bit slower. Um, but, you know, it was all his and had a great exit. So I think that's yeah, one. I like, I like Dude Solutions. Um, I'm yeah. trying not, not to name ours, by the way. I'm trying not to be self-promoter here but dude solutions was a great you know great business as well um and kent and lee did a great job you know getting it to incredible scale okay here's a question from steve marks uh so this time is forcing a lot of changes to the way businesses and people operate uh, more efficiency new technology etc how is it affecting bull city uh, are you targeting any new areas or types of companies as a result of COVID? Has it changed your focus at all? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, I think the, the thing we're trying to make sure we don't fall in the trap of is um, there have, been, as I mentioned earlier, there have been some companies in our portfolio, portfolio that have really accelerated because of this. And there's some companies, obviously, outside of our portfolio that have accelerated because of what's going on. Right. I think it's like, hey, are we seeing, you know, when companies are presenting this ho- new hockey stick to us, is it because of what's happening right now? And we're going, they're going to, you know, lose that momentum uh, okay. afterwards? Or, or maybe, they, maybe they lose a little bit, maybe it comes down a, a tad, and it's still really positive. So I think it's something that we're watching. I think it's also interesting to see like businesses that are very resilient. You know, I think that's probably the, another thing we're seeing is some businesses that are very resilient in this market and have proven ROI for their customer base. And so um, like this one I mentioned the other day that we or one, I guess this week that we gave a verbal um, offer to, is is one that kind of fits that where it's an entrepreneur we've known for uh over 12 months we like the business and you know he's still uh, it's a so- it's a software company and you know his churn continues to be really low he's still closing new deals uh so we're not really seeing a blip but so now i guess my, to answer the question we're not changing our investment philosophy at all um in fact um some of our best some of our best returns as a firm over the last 20 years have been generated during downturns. Mm -hmm. So we continue to play offense and make sure that we are still out there finding entrepreneurs and and investing. Well, I guess more broadly speaking, uh, some of the challenge of, you mentioned some companies are growing a lot now and trying to decide, you know, how much of that is because of very specific circumstances Totally. For, for now, you know, versus people are now adopting things that they'll keep. Um, I mean, I guess that's something no one can know for sure. Um, but something like how, how, are, how are you guys grappling with that, whether for your portfolio companies or just in general? So what, what's, can you restate the question a little bit? Well, like, what do you, what do you think uh, of, what do you think of the changes now that are going to say more permanent? Like, do you think, okay, you mm. know, remote work when people can go back to the office, not that many people are going to want to go, oh, go back. I mean, or, you know, presu- I think most people think remote work is going to be bigger and sort of stay bigger. It's not going to be as big as now, but um, you know, some things that people have 
sort of been forced to change behavior now that might stick more because yeah, I, think, more I look at this as more I, I look at this more pete as like accelerating trends that were already happening in the market um more than anything else so right. for example like we we invested in attila security up in up in maryland mm -hmm. they focus yeah. on um and we made this investment you know where we sit uh and an incredible entrepreneur his name is greg smith but attila is focused on security for remote workers so we've kind of already had like this thesis of and it's already a trend happening right okay. so i think what's happening now just accelerates things like that but that that was that was already developing in in you know bu bubbling up um so i think you know it's just it's just being accelerated but I do think like e-commerce is huge. Um, you know, we've invested in several, I mentioned, you know, with Josh's company, <clears throat> art.com, which we invested in, you know, back in, gosh, 2004, which we've exited. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're an investor in Spoonflower, Global Value Commerce, and all of those companies are doing, you know, really, really well right now. Uh, here's a question from Judith Irwin. So what is your firm's prediction for the likelihood of deflation versus inflation in the coming months? And what messaging have your LPs given you about their view of alternative investing? You made me take that second part first. Like, what are you hearing from your LPs about, you know, their appetite for different kinds of? Yeah, <clears throat> no, that's, a, that's a great question. I think every venture capital firm is, 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 you know, communicating with their LPs. And right, right now, I, I think I mentioned earlier that a lot of our companies are over communicating with us. We're doing the same thing with our LP base. So we're um, holding more one-on-one -on -one calls. We're holding more Zooms like this. We're doing, um, we're, we, I, think, I think we're, we're sending more letters. We're, uh, so I think the communication is just, is, is just ramped, ramped way up. We, um, I think we are also, um, you know, from an L, I, I think the LP base is kind of, um, so our, by the way, is like 70 beneficial. The institutions, I think, are more calm. I think the individual LPs get a little more nervous, especially when like the Dow is like at 18,000. Right. And, and so, Today, the market is, you know, it's down, but depends what sectors you're, you're in. Like, if you're, in, if you're an investor, if you're a heavy investor in the public markets and the tech sector, you're actually up year to date, by the way. Right. Okay, so the NASDAQ is actually at a, at a high for the year. Um, and I haven't checked today, whatever. Well, actually, yeah, I haven't checked today, but like, it was yesterday. <clears throat> so... I think, and I think there's a huge disconnect there between, or a little bit, you know, between what's happening in the economy and the markets. But I think there's just been a tremendous amount of, as everyone knows, you know, stimulus that's been injected into the into the um, into the market, as well as interest rates at zero, which are which are pushing all of this, you know, up, you know, into the right. <clears throat> I don't know about the inflation deflation thing. <clears throat> um, i you know, uh, I'll leave that to the economists to to figure out. But I do know from the LP base, our, you know, I guess in summary, like our, <clears throat> our institutional LPs feel very, very secure, love the strategy. Um, and, and I think, by the way, they're, they're, they, they see a blip here, but the way venture capital works, right, is we're thinking eight, 10 years out on some of our companies. We're not building companies for the next you know, few months. We're building okay. them for the next, you know, hopefully durable companies the last eight to 10 years. The other thing that I think it helps Pete, and the one thing I wanted to add is like, it helped by the way that we had three exits last year. So including two in December. So I think that that also buys a lot of like extra credibility and a little bit of rope and with, with our investors, with your own. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, well, that makes sense. All right, so here's a question from, I guess somewhat related from uh, Scott Devitt. Hi, Jason. How does the public market inform you generally about valuations in the private market, if at all? Do you think the public market is a good current indication of what you were seeing in the private world in these unique times? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, Scott, Scott Devitt. So, all right. So, um, I do think like we do look at it, and it it, it does influence um, valuations in that entrepreneurs will look at I don't know. Um, the you know market comps right and that is one that's just one data point of some comps out there are this is what you know is is happening in the public markets uh and so they'll point to that obviously we use a pretty a pretty steep discount typically to what's happening in a in the public market but it's it's one one thing that we do look at all right um here's a question this might be and very specific one from Chris Codney. Would you have any recommendations here or elsewhere for funding support of a small startup seeking to address the issue that the United Nations has called the second biggest threat to global biodiversity after habitat loss, invasive species, uh, affects all continents except Antarctica? I have a feeling that Chris Codney might have a company that's trying to fight uh, invasive species. That might be a- Pete, what's the question? Give me, give me the. Give I me the, don't even really. Vada, do you have any advice for a startup trying to address the issue of invasive species? Or did you guys do anything in kind of a environmental space? No, I didn't think so. Uh, let's see. Are, are there any other questions? This is that last call. Well, I think perhaps that we've taken enough of your time, uh, but thanks so much uh, for coming. I thanks, you thanks very much, Pete. This is great. I really appreciate you doing this. Oh, wait. No, no. Someone, uh, <laughs> no. And one last question from okay. Joe Colopy. Murder hornets. What do you think? Murder hornets? I think, um, actually, there was another, was there another uh, insect that just came out that's actually a bigger threat? Um, I don't think I, I can take any more threats. Uh, bigger than the murder hornets? Yeah, I, th I think I just read about that like last night. Like there was something else bigger than the than that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think. Wait, hold on, hold on, Pete. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But there was something else. Hornet. Um. I don't know. I there was, I there, was there was something else. I I can't. I don't want to spend much time on this. But there's something else out there that was actually like another insect threat. So we'll all right, I mean, I, I saw it yesterday someone showing that the murder hornets are like this big, but then someone told me that's just the queens. Oh, really? Like they don't they don't leave. So you know, I don't know. I guess regular mur murder hornets are. I'm not. You know, it's like then I can't even go outside them. There's gonna be murder hornets. I'm surprised that's. I'm actually surprised that's Joe Coffee's question. Like I'm about. You know, rather than anything about the, the the bike race or the scooter race. Scooter race, yeah. He's mentioned that. Uh, let's say more than once. Of know? course, yes. There might be. A, there, there should be some sort of rematch. Well, he yeah. cheated the first time. Oh well, that's uh. What? Well, in what way did he cheat? Well, you you get the video of it, right? He didn't go yeah. go around where. He had I didn't go that far. Or you, you felt he cut the course. Sure. I totally did. Totally did. Okay, wait. Now, now someone's think, thinking that the gypsy moth might not. Is that the uh, the big threat? I think it is. I think it is. Someone did. Someone bring that up. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's it. All right. Well, gypsy moths. They've been around forever. How bad can they be? It might be that. I don't know. I can. I can. I can push it out later on on Twitter once I find it. All right. Yeah. Let's. Uh, We'll have to return to those uh, to those pressing issues. Uh, but thanks everyone uh, for coming, and uh, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you.